it is never okay to lie to a patient under any circumstance. Outline the arguments for and against the statement. So as doctors, I think one of the key things that we have to maintain is trust and integrity with patients. So some may say that lying is never okay because if you were to lie, it might break that doctor-patient relationship and compromise that so that they don't feel safe, they don't feel open as though they can be honest about um, conditions. I think as well, lying would stop informed consent. If a doctor was withholding information or lying about a diagnosis or about a treatment or something like that, that would really stop informed consent and that is not ethical at all. A patient should be able to have full information about the risks and the benefits and what goes on within the treatment. And as well, kind of professionally and legally, we cannot lie to patients but some people may disagree and say that there are some specific circumstances where lying is okay. And this is um, done therapeutically when people may be at risk in a given moment in time if they were to understand the full truth and then it is okay to withhold tr the truth. But overall, I personally believe that to maintain integrity and honesty and a trusting relationship is paramount in the underlying foundations of a patient-doctor relationship and so should be maintained at all times. You are a medical professional working in a rural community. One of your patients who is pregnant has been diagnosed with a condition that requires urgent medical attention in a city hospital. However, the patient does not want to leave her family behind and refuses to go to the hospital. What ethical considerations should you take into account in deciding how to proceed? So the first thing I would want to do in this situation is really offer compassion to this patient. They're pregnant and obviously it's, it can be an incredibly stressful and emotional time. And so I'd want to offer them the best support I could. And so what I'd want to do is try and understand why they don't want to go to the hospital at that time. Is it because of practical reasons of they've got a child at home that needs um, looking after or if they have a responsibility that they needed? or maybe that they didn't necessarily think that they could get to the hospital because being in a rural location there can obviously be some limited resources with public transport and things like that. So the first thing I'd want to do is discuss if there are any practical reasons that are stopping them from going to the hospital and trying to solve them together to try and offer and say, oh, I can communicate with your husband. I can try and organize the transport and may maybe say, get order a taxi for you if that's something that you would want us to do. So I think practical is the first thing to kind of eliminate off. And then I'd really want to make sure that the patient understands and has informed consent about why as a doctor I'm recommending that they attend um, hospital. So maybe it be it could be because of gestational diabetes, which I know I think can be is it can be common in pregnant women where they then require treatment that is for the health and safety of the baby but also for themselves and to try and help educate them on why I think that it's really important but also at the same time acknowledging that a patient has autonomy and if they have um, informed consent on the situation that they can then make that decision themselves. So I think overall that in this ethical situation I would have to understand if a patient decides that they do not want to go because that is their own decision and the patient has autonomy but to be openly communicating to try and solve the problems and have an open and honest conversation to try and prevent any problems further down the line that could have any risks to both the mother or child. Is it better to perform 100 hip replacements or 10 brain surgeries? Provide reasons for your conclusion. So when making these kind of decisions, the thing that we really need to take into consideration is patient impact and outcomes and which is gonna have the best patient improved outcomes. So a hip replacement, for example, could be given if there was maybe a fall and then a fracture that needed assistance with, or maybe if there is pain and swelling to the area where other treatments cannot work and a replacement is the best thing. So for these people, they could go from really having restricted mobility and having to rely on others 
close to then having a complete cure where they can be independent again, they can walk to the shops and everything is fixed. But also we need to understand that with these hip surgeries that there is the risk of infection and complications from surgery that could then affect them. And then if we think about what tends to happen with brain surgeries, brain surgeries tend to be associated with a lot more risk. There is risk of damaging other areas of the brain, so they may have, say, motor complications or speech and memory problems further down the line. But they also tend to be for the more serious cases, for example, removing a brain tumour. Now, this is a very complex surgery and removing the brain tumour can have a significant impact on people's lives. They can go from living in pain and from suffering from lots of symptoms and preventing that. But there also becomes the risk of these treatments may not necessarily be curing people. Just like the hip replacements, things like brain tumours, it may be that it inevitably will come back, unfortunately. So I think that's another thing that we need to take into consideration. So I think the main things are cost and resource allocation. I would think about you know the price differences between the surgeries but also the amount of people that are going to be impacted by this a hundred people could really have an improved quality of life versus just the 10 people so if we look on just a pure number scale then a hundred hip surgeries would seem more beneficial but i think we also need to take into consideration the individual hospital do they have access to specialist surgeons who are at in hip replacements or maybe if we are a brain specialist center then maybe that could be something that we need to take into consideration where the resource allocation is and what would be most beneficial for the patients in that area so i think it's important to note that this is a difficult situation and that all patients deserve care but if we look in terms of improved outcomes for patients, you could maybe say that 100 hip replacements would be more beneficial than the 10 brain surgeries. You are a surgeon. A 16 year old has attended your clinic alone and requests a rhinoplasty. A rhinoplasty is an operation to alter the appearance of the nose. She states that she's getting bullied at school for her appearance. She hates how her nose looks but reports no other symptoms. Should you perform the surgery, what ethical considerations should you take into account? So I think it's important to note that a rhinoplasty can be taken for a variety of reasons. One can be medically because of issues with breathing, so that can help alleviate their breathing issues, but also it can be done for a more cosmetic and aesthetic um, scenario where they want to try and change the shape of their nose. So I think it would be important to give this patient um, information and education about the surgery and why it, why it is often given and make sure that they have informed consent and really understand the risks of the surgery. It's not a minor surgery, it can be associated with risks and complications and it's really important that they understand that. But I think the main um, thing that I would want to do as a doctor here is really help the patient understand and offer them support, emotional support specifically, because they were noting that they were getting bullied. Maybe they wanted to change the shape of their nose because they think that would stop the bullying and really offer that emotional support, whether that be seeing if we wanted to help them with counseling or CBT therapy, or maybe get in contact with the school and to see if they're aware of that situation. So I think initiating an open and honest conversation with the patient is really important in this situation because as a 16 year old who is maybe going through emotional times and you know school can be a very difficult place and it's important to offer support for that person and show that there are alternative measures that we can go to before quite an invasive procedure has to occur. Why do you think the General Medical Council encourages doctors to not accept gifts from patients? I think a really important one is maintaining professional boundaries. Whilst we always want to develop a patient-doctor relationship to ensure an open environment for the best of everyone's healthcare, I think it's important that a professional boundary is maintained and so that there is no risk of a conflict of interest. Maybe some people may feel as though if they've given 
a significant gift that they are then entitled to maybe better care or a shorter waiting time, but that is not how the NHS discriminates. The NHS discriminates only on patient needs, not on gifts and kind of blurring of professional boundaries. So I think that's a really important reason why people would never accept gifts. I think as well, another important one is for those who are vulnerable. For those who are really in need of care and things like that, they do not feel as though they have to give a gift to get this doctor's um, advice. And so that's really important that, particularly in the vulnerable populations, that we are not accepting money that could be very, very significant to them. Everyone should be entitled to healthcare and for all. I think the important thing though would to be do if you were in this scenario is to offer an alternative and say we do not need any gifts I'm here to look after you and offer any advice as much as I can do maybe if you feel like we are deserving of something maybe offer a donation to the local hospital charity or the charity that we support so that it can go back out into the community and help people if people are very insistent on giving gifts or maybe even just say a box of chocolates that can be shared in the staff room. So I think to conclude that gifts should never be accepted if they are of high monetary value from a patient because it can put at risk conflicts of interest, blurred patient boundaries um, and offer those alternatives so that you can still maintain this patient doctor relationship. An advanced directive is a statement of instruction about what medical and healthcare treatment you want to refuse in the future in case you lose the capacity to make these decisions. A patient has an advanced directive in place stating that they do not wish to be resuscitated in the event of a cardiac arrest. However, the patient's family members are not aware of the directive and insist that all measures to be taken to resuscitate the patient and are concerned he isn't in the right state of mind to make decisions about his health. What should the healthcare do in this situation? The first thing that I would do is go and check the validity of the advanced directive and make sure that it is applicable to this situation of cardiac arrest. And if it was to be valid, I would then facilitate a meeting with the family in a private area because I need to acknowledge this is an incredibly emotional situation and we want to have an open and honest conversation. So what I would do is I would explain to the family what an advanced directive is and explain that this has been signed by the patient and it is their decision. A patient has their own autonomy about decisions that can be made about their healthcare. And it's really important to emphasize that this patient themselves had capacity and was fully aware of the situation and consented to this advanced directive to be put in place. And I would also maybe start by saying why an advanced directive has been put in place in this case. Now, for some people who have lots of underlying health conditions or are quite elderly and frail, by conducting CPR, they are going to maybe have a damage that they would not be able to recover from, such as broken ribs from having the CPR done to them, and that actually they are going to be in more pain as a result of having the CPR. And that is something that the patient is aware of in that condition. So I would kind of explain this to the family. And I'd also ask them if they have any questions that they wanted to know about the patient's condition, how they can best support them with that decision and come as like a collective together. So it's a happy and positive environment for that patient. And if they were still to push on this idea and say that they don't agree, and that they're still really pushing for CPR. At that point, that's when I would ask for a second opinion and ask for some support and maybe try and facilitate some family counselling with you know, someone who specialises in medical ethics and law in these scenarios to really um, help the patient's family come to terms with this advanced directive. Were the 2023 junior doctor strikes ethical? If so, under what conditions? So the junior doctor strikes that were recently carried out were in support of better working conditions and better pay for the junior doctors who are overworked, working in incredibly stressful environments and 
um, basically asking for pay restoration from in 2008. They're not asking for a wage increase, they're just asking for a restoration of where it was initially. So if we think about in the short term, what are some of the consequences of these strikes that could have ethical implications? So there were, I think, around 200,000 appointments that were cancelled across the three or four days that the strikes took place. And so that is going to have an impact on patients immediately. Patients that were coming in for checkups and for minor procedures are having them cancelled. So that is going to have an impact on that. It's then going to mean that the staff that are working at that time are going to face even more increased pressures that's going to put stress on other members of the healthcare team and maybe even on the consultants particularly in areas they've maybe not worked in in a very long time the jobs that traditionally junior doctors do so i think that can also cause a bit of a risk and if we think about it in the long term there's also the backlog of the appointments from all of the ones that have to be cancelled. They're then having to be rearranged. And that's putting even more of a backlog on such waiting lists that are already really huge. And again, there is always going to be a compromise of patients' care. But I think it's really important to know of the reasons of why they need to be done ethically, the strikes. Some people would say that if the strikes did not occur, then even worse ethical implications could happen further down the line because junior doctors are leaving and going to work in other countries or just completely stepping out of the healthcare profession. And then that means we're gonna lose doctors and there's gonna be less doctors per patient and then that's gonna compromise safety. And also as well, particularly with the um, age category that are striking that's then going to mean that consultant positions aren't going to be filled and kind of the specialists for the people that are having to deal with the most complicated diseases and multiple diseases together are not necessarily going to be there in the future so i think it's a really interesting discussion when we talk about the ethical implications if we think about long term versus short term but i think ultimately we're not going to completely understand the ethical repercussions until the future whether that is there going to be a, a change within the healthcare institution that brings about these changes and therefore the cancellations of appointments are maybe seen as minimal versus the huge impacts on patient care that could happen or alternatively there could be no changes and it could be continuing so I think it's a really open but interesting discussion that we'll just have to wait for the future to see. You are treating a patient who has a chronic illness that is causing them significant pain and suffering. The patient is considering physician-assisted suicide, but this is not legal in the UK. What are the ethical arguments for and against assisted suicide in patients with chronic pain? So I understand assisted suicide to be when a physician helps or aids an individual end their own life, whether that be because they are experiencing a terminal illness or really intense pain. I think in, in response to this question that specifically asks about chronic illnesses, I think the first thing that I'd want to emphasise is the impacts of holistic care and alternative measures that could be given from a physician, whether that be cognitive behavioural therapy, whether we can explore if there are different pain medications or alternative dosing that could be offered to them to help them alleviate from this pain, or maybe physiotherapy, whether that could help, because I think it's really important to acknowledge that chronic pain can really have an impact on people's lives and when they can't see a change in that it can be very difficult and so I think it's important to, that we as healthcare teams try and help these individual patients as much as possible but if we're going back to the question of the arguments for and against patient assisted suicide physician assisted suicide sorry some people may argue that it could be a good thing because patients, we always say in medicine, patients should have autonomy. They should be able to make their own healthcare decisions. So they should be able to choose when to end their life. Some people may also um, say yes, because to alleviate suffering, like we said, these people can be living in such incredible amounts of pain and that death might be peaceful for them if they are given the choice and control over death for them it can maybe you know be more peaceful be more private and that it would be a less painful death but other people would argue and say that as physicians and as doctors we should 
it, we should always abide to non-maleficence. We should never be causing harm to patients. Sanctity of life and our whole job as doctors is to help patients as much as we can to live the best life that they can. And as we know, assisted suicide is illegal in the UK and that is not allowed. So I think to conclude, um, it is illegal in the UK and that I think that the arguments against are more powerful and that maybe in these circumstances alternative holistic measures should be encouraged and definitely explored to help this patient come to terms with their chronic illness. Is it ethical to use placebo treatments in medical research studies even if it means withholding potentially life-saving treatments from some participants? So currently, randomised clinical trials are the gold standard in research. It is where, say, we are, have a given population, half are given the treatment that they are looking to investigate and half are given a placebo, which is a drug or an injection or something that looks like the real treatment but just doesn't have the active ingredient in. And they're really important in understanding the true effectiveness of the treatment. It allows the best statistical um, results and the direct comparison to really ensure that this treatment, if we're going to approve it and say use it in the NHS, that it really is having a good impact on patients. Some people may argue that it is not fair to give people placebo treatments because why would you give it to them when you know that this treatment has the potential to have a positive impact on people's lives and I think it's important to note that when people consent to randomised clinical trials they have informed consent and they understand that there is the possibility of being given the placebo, they're not being misled or anything but I think it is important to acknowledge that alternative trials could take place instead of it maybe being placebo versus treatment it could be the current treatment that's given on the NHS versus this new treatment that we're looking at to see if there is a significant difference um, between the two. So I think it is important to acknowledge that we can have the alternatives but I think ultimately having the um, placebo is really important to generate the most effective medicines and to eventually have the best impact on patients that we can. A consultant gynaecologist is about to see his next patient who is a pregnant woman. The reason for the appointment is to terminate her pregnancy. The consultant himself doesn't want to perform abortions due to his religious beliefs, but will see the patient for the initial consultation and then refer it to another colleague to conduct the abortion. Should doctors be able to refuse treatment based on their personal beliefs and religious convictions? So I think some people may believe that in this situation that a patient's autonomy could be at risk. Maybe if they're passing judgment it could make them feel stigmatised and then be more likely to then go and seek out other means that are more dangerous to the person's both physical health and mental health if they are trying to find alternative abortions if they don't feel like they can have an open and honest conversation with the doctor. I think some people may also think that if there is this transition between one doctor and another, not having this continuity of care can really become a bit of an issue and it's not fair on a patient for them to have to wait time and things like that. But I think if a doctor is not passing their judgment, if they are giving them all of the correct and informed advice and that there is no delay between the doctors passing over, between the appointment versus the procedure itself, a doctor is entitled to help hold their own beliefs and if it is not impacting the patient directly, then I think that this is ethically okay.